Yes, she can. <coughs> yes, she can. Right. <coughs> So the idea that the older you were born in your family, compared to your other siblings, can somehow affect your personality in life has, I suppose, been around for hundreds, if not billions of years. And if I was to tell you that firstborns tend to be very successful, middleborns are Mr. or Mrs. Rebellious, younger siblings, they're very sociable, they get a lot of attention, and only children are fiercely independent gets. You'd probably be like, yeah, I can see that. But does that make it true? Or is that just you going, yeah, I can see that. Welcome to Anime Investigates, where we'll talk to experts on the subject. I suppose it'd be weird if I talked to them about a different subject. We could do that. Shall I make the rest of the video about dogs? Or, or leggings? Or dogs in leggings? Yes. But before that, let's uh, talk to old grandma science about how she first started to knit the badly woven jumper that is the birth order effect. Imagine the year is 1874. You're this 52-year-old man called Francis Galton, and you're about to confound the scientific community by becoming the first person to notice that the Royal Institute is mostly made up of first-born sons. And thus, you become the first scientific pioneer to contribute to the notion of the birth order effect. Well done, mate. You do later go on to invent eugenics, though, so don't get too cocky. Now, imagine that it's 1927, and you're this 57-year-old man called Alfred Adler, a man with the exact opposite hair. You started to study the effects of birth order, which probably had nothing to do with the fact that you were intensely jealous of your older brother. The socially mistaken pattern is built up in the first four or five years. Mostly we find is reasons for it imperfect organs, or that the child had been pampered, or that we find hated children is among orphans, sometimes illegitimate children, ugly children, not wanted children, and so on. Together with Freud, you have been busy kickstarting the psychoanalytic movement, developing theories of personality that focus on an individual within the context of their social environment, which is kind of great of you, and you're basically an all round nice guy. Which makes what I'm about to say one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. Look, I'm really sorry to be the one to tell you, but in 1937 you died. You were just getting started. You, you thought so much about birth order, you didn't even see it coming. And the 2000 or so studies that have been published since you kicked the bucket so hard you popped your clogs off have been about as mixed in their outcomes as that metaphor. Very mixed. So I think it's about time we ask a psychologist why they think birth order is such a confusing subject. Hi Vanessa, uh, so why do you think birth order is such a confusing subject? Yeah, I think it's confusing because I think the effects probably vary based on how many kids you have. So when we think of birth order, I think a lot of the findings are with like two kids and they look at the first and the second, mm -hmm. but I think it matters how many you are, what the spacing between children are like, and what the genders are. So the two major findings, the one that's really solid is that the firstborn tends to do better in school. Yeah, yeah, slightly more and intelligent. more compliant, <laughs> more rule following. And the second one is more likely to break the rules. These are like the only findings that are consistent, just like what I said in my blog. Mm -hmm. But I think why the data is so mixed and you don't see anything consistent except for those two things is that you have all of this variability in the data. So you're not gonna find anything super consistent because there's so many factors involved, I suppose, right? There's so many factors that probably uh, play a role in birth order. Yeah. And my own experience, because you asked about my own experience as a parent now, I have two kids. They conform with the stereotypes. They're two okay. boys, um, a, fi a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and the five-year-old is really compliant. He's rule-following. Um, and I, he's good. He excels in school. And the second one, he's only two, but he's already already like, being the rebellious one. He's a rebel. Oh, okay. He's a rebel. He's a maniac. But I think so. 
One thing it has to do with the child's temperament. So I think part of it is just who they are and it has nothing to do with me or birth order. Like it happened to be that yeah. these are the personalities they had. But I think it also probably interacts with the parents. So you're just more nervous the first time. And the first one gets like two, three, however many years of full time attention before the second one comes around. And I'm just more laid back with the second one than the first one and less nervous. And I think that that rubs off on them. So Your own nervousness rubs off on your children and there's lots of data to support that so I think part of it is just the environment they grow up in so they get more attention uh, they want to please their parents more the second one probably gets less attention but probably gets a less anxious mom so there have been many studies that show that anxiety can be inherited so if you're about to have kids try not to let that worry you but what do we know about other aspects of personality. One of the most famous pers persons on the subject is Frank Soloway. If you analyze every personality test on Earth in every possible language, they're really only telling you sort of five basic things. And those five things are attributes that relate to conscientiousness, uh, to agreeableness, to extroversion, uh, to what's called openness to experience, and finally neuroticism or anxiety related traits. And we know from uh, from sibling differences that uh, birth order leads to uh, differentiation along these five dimensions. Well, if we look at the birth order literature as a whole for the last 40 or 50 years, there are uh, literally over a thousand studies, and we sort of sum them all up uh, using what, what uh, uh, statisticians call meta-analysis, we get a very clear picture of firstborns indeed being more conscientious uh, than laterborns, laterborns being somewhat more agreeable, more, uh, more extroverted in the sense of being sociable, uh, more open to experience in the sense of being unconventional, untraditional, sometimes rebellious, and finally very minimal differences on uh, neuroticism. However, since then more recent studies have started to show that the effects of birth order on personality aren't quite so simple and in fact are quite, quite difficult, which is why I've spoken to our next Gelf, 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 Ralph. <laughs> Uh, so yes, I'm looking into birth order at the moment, and it seems to be quite a, a confusing subject that changes its mind quite a lot. And um, it's sort of conventional wisdom seems to suggest that, you know, most people you talk to seem to think that it's at least a thing, or that you can um, associate a little bit with some of the issues or ideas. But your study seems to say the opposite. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit about that study? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the study that we did uh, and I can tell you a little bit more about the confusion, but the study that we did uh, was concerning risk-taking behavior because there was uh, the hypothesis in the literature going back to the work really by um, Selloway, Frank Selloway, uh, that later borns would be more risk-taking, more risk-loving, more exploratory, uh, traveling the world, uh, taking more risks in general. Uh, and uh, we were for various reasons, totally open to that possibility. Uh, and we're looking at uh, major data sets. We had uh, uh, one data set that had, um, I think, if I remember correctly, over 30,000 people. Uh, it was a longitudinal study that was conducted here in Germany. And we had another data set that was uh, substantially smaller, uh, 1,500 people, but it had many, 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 many different measures of uh, risk-taking behavior. And basically, in neither of these two analyses, we found any birth order effects with regard to risk-taking behavior. That's interesting. And how then, because the study also seems to suggest that that means that uh, birth order doesn't affect personality. So did you only look at risk, or did you look at sort of other big five personality traits? Uh, no, we didn't do that. We, we really focused on risk. Uh, there was another study a few years ago uh, by con conducted by uh, Julia Bora and her colleagues, and they used the same big data set. Okay. So this is this big longitudinal data set, and that the data set also next to risk-taking behavior included personality uh, questions, the big five. And in their study, uh, they also did not find any effects on personality. In other words, we have now these two big studies, mm. uh, risk-taking behavior, that's what we did, and she did uh, personality features, and neither one finds uh, birth order effects. Wow. How do you go about explaining this, the, the articles that come out and sort of suggest that there is something to birth order? So, well, first of all, let me say is we, we need to be very clear about what is the, the, the dimension that we are looking at. 
Uh, so, for instance, uh, there are uh, a number of studies that have looked at um, parental resources being distributed as a function of birth order in the family. If you think, for instance, about parental time, how much time do I spend with the firstborn, second, third, and so on. And with regard to the time allocation within the family, there are pretty clear uh, birth order effects. Um, they are measurable. This, is, this has nothing to do with personality yet. This is just a distribution of resources within the family. Of course, it is tempting to say, well, if uh, a parent spends more time with, say, the firstborn and with the, uh, with the middleborn, then this has consequences. Yeah. But that's speculation. So with regard to some variables, there's clear evidence. Also, by the way, there's clear, seems to be pretty clear evidence that birth order affects intelligence, IQ measures uh, within the family. So in other words, there are measures where it's uh, not disputed that uh, birth order affects uh, occur. The question is, do they occur with regard to personality and do they occur with regard to risk taking behavior, for instance? And um, now, why, why are these inconsistent uh, findings in the literature? There are a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that everybody agrees to the extent that they do exist, if they exist at all, they are small. Even a person like Frank Selloway, uh, who became famous uh, with uh, suggesting these kinds of effects would agree that the effects are small, which means that a lot of the studies are underpowered. Uh, in other words, they don't have the sample size to even find uh, these small effects. Okay. Um, can I ask what your um, opinion is outside of the study? Like, um, do you what's your birth order, and do you, have you ever found yourself identifying with it? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a middleborn. Uh, Same. There we go. The there is a, the middleborn effect supposedly in terms of parental allocation of resources is quite established that mm. the middleborns relative to the, the firstborns and laterborns tend to re, tend to receive fewer resources. That has something to do with the fact that uh, the the, uh, the firstborns they have this period of exclusive attention of the parents, right? When they are born, there's nobody else in the family. Yeah. And if you think about the last born in the family, everybody else has already left the family, all older siblings. And so there's this later born, which still enjoys the exclusive attention. The people in the middle, in a way, you could argue they are screwed because they are in the family when uh, everybody else is also in the family. So I get I get fewer of the uh, resources, even if, if the parents try to be totally fair, uh, they, they cannot help but to give you fewer resources because everybody else is still in the family. So uh, these kinds of effects have been shown. I, I'm pretty convinced that these effects exist. It's a different question what they mean and whether they have consequences for the well-being or personality of uh, the child. That's a, that's a totally different question. But, but coming back to risk, um, so one of the things that we are looking at is this. If you talk to people uh, about birth order effects and risk taking, then most people have the intuitive impression Yes, yeah, sure. There is something to it. Uh, my my younger uh, my younger brothers or, or sisters they were just more risk taking. They did more stupid things. Uh, and and there are a number of and, and and that seems to suggest there is a birth order effect. They are just taking more risks. Well, that's one possibility that there is a birth order effect. But there is another possibility, namely that the younger child or the younger children, they have a model. They have you as the older one and you have, you are more developed. You have more motoric skills, you have more intellectual skills, you are doing things that the younger child not yet can do. And yet there is a model. You are showing me that uh, you can do it and I try it and I will fail. And one interpretation of that failure is that the child is a risk taker. But that is more a function of the fact that there is an older model who does more daring things that you are not yet able to do. That's one possibility. There is another possibility that uh, I find interesting, namely, so Selloway's uh, hypothesis about risk taking behavior is think of a family like as a place with different ecological niches. So there's the firstborn that moves into the family and basically occupies the niche that is closest to the parents. I'm the good boy or the good girl, I'm uh, loyal to the parents, I get all the resources of the parents. But the problem is if the next born comes into the family, that slot is taken. 
I, uh, as, as a later ball, I cannot take that slot because the older ball has already occupied it. Now, the idea of Cellar Wave is that it forces the later ball to be more exploratory, to be more risk-taking, to learn something new that attracts the attention of the parent uh, and, and thereby basically undo the disadvantage that the later borns have structurally. Now, it could be that indeed during the period of the child's life in the family, that means that I'm more risk-taking. But it doesn't necessarily mean that these materialize in personality differences because it could well be that once I leave the family, and I'm no longer sub subject to the dynamic of the family and of the family niche idea that uh, I can behave totally differently. I can be conservative, I can be cautious, I can be whatever. Yeah. So in other words, you see these behavioral differences during the development in the family, but they don't necessarily materialize in terms of personality. They don't have to define us. So what can we learn from all this? If birth order does have an effect on personality, and you want to escape these patterns you've developed in your younger years, what should you do? Should you just kill all, all your older siblings if you want to become more responsible? No, probably not. But our next guest might have some insight into what you can do. We've been doing a retreat, the eldest daughter retreat, which we'll be doing for the fourth time up in Fintorn in Scotland uh, mid-March. And there, it is so funny to be with 20 other eldest daughters and to see them do what you do all the time. Like try to rearrange everybody at the table, you know how... Yeah, who takes and, charge? And, <laughs> and of course, a big subject is also, you know, how can I come out of the position that I take care of the family and of the, the elderly parents? And, and even at some point, how can I, you know, give the others the opportunity to do so? Because once we become aware of that pattern of thinking we ha are responsible for everybody all the time, which is, you know, not true, can't be true. Uh, when we step back, the others can step in and, and the relationship is much more, more flowing and natural and, and equal as it, as it should be when you've grown up. Yeah, I think it being um, aware of how your family dynamic makes you inclined to act in relationships, that you act out certain narratives. I think being aware of that can really help. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, that's the whole thing. Becoming aware of the pattern, seeing the pattern, and then and then making an informed choice. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not going to do it. What happens when I don't do it? And then very often you have to kind of stand some fear. If I don't do it, then you know the most horrible thing is going to happen. It doesn't. So, what would your advice be then for maybe firstborns who take too much responsibility, or and then maybe middle children who find it hard to uh, define themselves, and and younger siblings who are a bit attention seeking uh, would, you, would you have any advice for those people can they escape those I mean, dynamics it's to, well, to read a book of course the other daughter effect of course. But, but really to observe to observe those and to know that it is a pattern running in you it's not necessarily you it's okay. just patterns that were bred in you know we talk about group dynamics group dynamics have been quite you know people kind of understand what happens in a group but in a family, you're in group dynamics 24-7 for 18 years or so, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's no small wonder that that forms you. And also, you might have become somebody in the world. Then when you're back in your family, all of a sudden, you're the youngest and you don't know anything about anything, right? Yeah. So, so you could also maybe bring it up sometimes in your family and say, do we really want to stick to these roles or, or have we become you know, other people outside of the family and, and could we bring a bit more in? But not not every family wants to host that conversation, of course. Yeah, but it's, so it's almost as if they definitely influence us, but we're not completely yeah. defined by it. But, but I think what... That's exactly it. Yeah, and I think uh, what can be useful for people is that... Um, is realizing that they're not defined by it and watching out for sort of any uh, family narratives that are trying to act themselves out in your life without you realizing, I suppose. Exactly, and and take what is best, you know. As elders, we come with this sense of responsibility, which is a heavy thing, it's also a good thing. We mm. come with a bit of bossiness, it's also a good thing. Mm. And we're very dutiful and reliable and serious, it's all a good thing. And and the youngest comes with this kind of, you know, a bit of carelessness, somebody will always take care of me, which is all, also a lovely trait. Yeah. And they're very good salespeople, they're very good with people. The middle ones come with these, you know, seeing how to broker you know differences we come out of our uh 
extra families also with really good things. So to, to keep those, mm. but not be determined by them. So even though birth order doesn't have to define us, it seems to be a very interesting lens that we can use to peer into all the things that do. And even Alfred Adler, that guy you were, said that it was only one small part of the bigger puzzle of personality. And obviously other things influence us, more important things being like what star sign you are, what day of the week you were born on, what Mulan character the internet says you are, Captain Lee Shang by the way. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, younger siblings have a higher mortality rate, so just try not to drop them. Thanks for watching. See you next time.